This is the Asia Trade. I'm Heidi Stroud. What's in Sydney? The top stories this hour. Asian stocks are set for a positive open to a week that brings rate decisions from the US and Japanese central banks. More big tech earnings are on the way too, with the Nasdaq 100 on the brink of correction. Oil traders are watching the risk of a wider Middle East conflict following a deadly rocket attack blamed on Hezbollah. Plus, Kamala Harris raises $200 million in her first week as a presidential contender, while a shortlist emerges for her choice of running mate. Well, certainly no uh, shortage of event risk for investors as we head into this brand new week. And of course, it really is uh, the events going into, of course, the Bank of Japan as well as the Fed. This sort of idea of a 32 hour window of central banking sprees for that decision making hanging over the markets. We are looking like a pretty optimistic setup, though, set to rise when it comes to the Asian trading session going into the early trading part of a week uh, that, of course, still holds quite a bit of risk. We are seeing Sydney futures up by just about. Uh, three quarters of one percent. Their Nikkei futures also positioning for a positive start to the trading week. A50 China futures there looking a little bit more muted, but about four tenths of one percent higher. We're also looking like some decent gains across Hong Kong as well. U.S. stocks, of course, providing that lead, surging on Friday amid these bets that uh, the Fed will uh, be cutting and uh, that will continue to kind of help fuel corporate earnings as well. We did see sort of equity contracts early this morning for the U.S. on the way up as well. The dollar looking little changed and uh, you can see that kind of reflected when it comes to trading in the Aussie dollar as well as the yen the latter of course being the key one that we're watching when it comes to the Bank of Japan and uh, that risk of potential disappointment do we see the uh, the gains we've seen in the last sort of few sessions for the yen really start to fade further taking a quick look at uh, how we're tra trading across treasuries going into the Fed decision as well as oil uh, uh, where oil is at at the moment we saw the biggest weekly decline since the beginning of May of course so much weighing on the state of trade when it comes to crude but uh, that China growth story is still there as well at the moment they were focusing on geopolitics we Israel threatening further military action after striking Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. This is in response to a rocket attack that killed a dozen young people in the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to exact a heavy price from Hezbollah, which has denied responsibility for the attack. Let's get some more from our Asia EcoGov editor Michael Heath here in Sydney. Michael, we continue to see the sort of escalation which continues to threaten the, the sort of regionalization of this conflict. Yeah, that's exactly right, Hardy. I mean, this is sort of a nightmare scenario that we're seeing now because since uh, almost since the the war began in in Gaza uh, Hezbollah and Israel have been trading trading shots in a way and, and there's been deaths on both sides but they, they've sort of kept it below a threshold that both sides understand um, that, that won't lead to further escalation now this this um, missile that that hit a, a children's soccer game in, in the Golan Heights sort of is well outside of that um, and Israel has, uh, has has struck back its hit weapons caches and, and various things there but the question is whether there's a larger one going on now there's a lot of reports and there's a lot of speculation um, the, the US has said it's been reported also um, off the record that uh, sorry not off the record but unattributed that um, that if Israel hits Beirut then that could lead to a, a spiraling um, of, of the fighting um, and everyone's sort of calling for calm. The, the, the point is that everyone sort of expects Israel to respond, but then the question is how Hezbollah responds to Israel. Uh, the other thing that the, the US has been saying, again, this is unattributed, um, is that it was probably a mistake by Hezbollah, that they, they will understand what the threshold is here, and to hit a, a children's soccer game wasn't exactly um, you know, part of what had been going on uh, in terms of the, the interactions there as well. But it's a very, very dangerous situation, no doubt. Hezbollah has said they'll stop when the fighting in Gaza stops. Right? Mm. We know that the sort of ceasefire talks are ongoing, but is there any potential for a longer-lasting truce? Because that's not what Israel has been okay with today. No, date. no, and and that that's that's sort of been the sticking point that uh, that the uh, Hamas wants this guarantee that there will be no. Uh, that once fighting stops, that's it, that's the end of the war. Israel won't guarantee that. They've been trying to fudge that, the, the mediators, Qatar, the US, Egypt, uh, finding a way of wording where, whereby um, Israel isn't hamstrung there in terms of restarting the war. The US certainly wants, uh, certainly is inclined that once there's a pause, the next stage would be to try to stop the conflict. But they, Israel just needs the, the wriggle room to be able to go back if something else happens kind of thing. Now, whether this um, spurs, more fight, spurs more efforts to, to get a, a deal done, uh, there is pressure building within Israel. It's been a long, long time. You know, we're 10 months into this war. 
the, the, uh, a lot of the hostages have died, but there's still a, a substantial number there who are believed to be alive. And the pressure from those families to, to have them released is, is just intensifying, uh, as you can imagine. I mean, it's a, it's a horrific situation. So, um, I mean, look, it's possible it could come out of the blue, but, but, you know, this has dragged on for a long time as well, so I wouldn't have my hopes too high. You know, Iran's Supreme Leader interestingly indicating there could be sort of an improvement in ties even as this goes on. I mean, how much would that be down to reining in their proxies? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, at the heart of it is Iran at the end of the day. I mean, if anyone wants to, to, to stop Hezbollah or anything like that, uh, I mean, look, they, they don't completely control Hezbollah. It can, can operate on its own, but, but it certainly supplies it. And the, the uh, Hezbollah denying that that was its missile, I mean, every indication is it's only Hezbollah that has those missiles. So uh, I'm not sure you can take that too seriously. But yes, I mean, Iran make, reaching out like that is, is quite interesting. But I mean, certainly things would have to change on the ground for the, in the Middle East for Europe or the US or anyone to take that seriously. I mean, Iran, you have to remember, is also supplying Russia with drones and all sorts of stuff to, to attack um, Ukraine civilian targets. I mean, there's a lot that Iran's doing that it'd have to rein in for, for anyone to be prepared to, to clasp the hands that have reached out. Mm. Our Asia economy and government editor Michael Heath there with the latest. Well, Bloomberg has learned that Vice President, US Vice President, I should say, Kamala Harris is zeroing in on a group of potential running mates. For more, let's bring in our breaking news managing editor, Derek Wallbank. And Derek, we've been sort of throwing around some of the, uh, the likely contenders. Has the field narrowed? Well, the reporting is right now that there are three names sort of at the top of the list. And things could change as Kamala Harris keeps uh, vetting these candidates, but right now we're seeing Mark Kelly, an Arizona senator, uh, Josh Shapiro, the governor of Pennsylvania, and Tim Walls, the governor of Minnesota. These are sort of the three names that people have uh, zeroed in on in the Harris campaign right now. Again, there are more people being vetted, but these are three of the names. They're kind of interesting uh, individuals. They've all won in swing states. They've all won in tough places. Uh, Mark Kelly, a former astronaut, uh, then came in into the Senate. Uh, he's married to Gabrielle uh, Giffords, who, uh, who herself a former congresswoman, now gun control advocate. Uh, Josh Shapiro sort of came up through the ranks in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's, you know, Pennsylvania is maybe the most critical swing state. Uh, he's somebody with an ability to uh, to win over uh, uh, conservative voters, one of the most popular politicians uh, in America right now. And then Tim Walls, uh, one of the highest ranking enlisted men to ever serve in Congress, uh, also a former school teacher uh, who, has, uh, who has attacked Trump on TV, uh, suggesting that, that uh, some of the behaviors he wouldn't have allowed when he ran the school lunches. So, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of different kind of uh, variables that you bring there, but really this is Kamala Harris's most important decision she will have had since she jumps in. This is going to be her partner, and as a number two her Herself right now, she knows better than anybody that uh, that your number one job as vice president is if something happens to the president, it's your time to step in. We've been looking at this sheer momentum for Kamala Harris, both in terms of the surge in support, the memes, of course, we've talked at length about, but also just the fundraising, $200 million in the first week. I guess my question is, you know, can, can this momentum be sustained, right? And how much of this is perhaps, I guess, a sheer relief of having an alternative? Well, you know, it's interesting, Heidi, because you never would have planned a campaign rollout like this, right? But it's hard to see how it could have gone better for Kamala Harris. Her poll numbers are up. Uh, she is doing better in swing states than Joe Biden did by a fair amount. Uh, we saw in an ABC poll that just came out overnight, our time, uh, that, that Harris is up a little bit since the announcement and Trump is actually down a little bit. Uh, Trump's pick of J.D. Vance maybe has not had a big resonance um, and, and Vance has had his own difficulties that he's had to contend with. Uh, and, and I think, as you mentioned, the, the money is really a critical factor. You know, we had been reporting that uh, fundraising for Joe Biden had been drying up, especially among some of his larger donors. With Harris, that's brand new. She's raised a ton of money, uh, the most in the cycle in the day after she, uh, after she announced. A lot of that was uh, smaller donations, and a lot of that was new donations, new donors who had not donated to the Biden campaign so far. Now, she brings 
a little bit of a different coalition than Joe Biden maybe does. So you're, so within those polls, you look into the crosstabs, maybe a little bit softer support from some older voters, but a lot more support from maybe younger voters uh, and voters of color who had been shying away from uh, from the Biden campaign. So it, so it may be a slightly different coalition. What does that look like in practice? Well, that means that maybe Kamala Harris has a slightly larger map that she can run in. Biden was really focused on Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, those three upper Midwest Rust Belt states. Kamala Harris maybe puts Georgia a little bit more in, in play. We mentioned Arizona and Mark Kelly. Maybe that's a, a state that she could, uh, she could play a little bit better in. North Carolina, uh, things like that. So, so it is a little bit of a better week for Harris, not just not just optically, but also foundationally, both in that map that she can run in and also in terms of the fundraising. Breaking news, managing editor Derek Wall, banker there. Well, the U.S. says uh, we're looking at the impact of U.S. election results, of course, and the ability to play out globally. They've already pledged that full force of its military to defend Japan and South Korea as the nation's defense chiefs met in Tokyo. The country signed a deal cementing gains in security cooperation before the U.S. elects a new president in November. It includes formalizing plans for regulatory military training, enhancing senior level talks and building on a deal to share real-time data on North Korean missile launches. Coming up on the Asia Trade, we'll be looking at the global economy in focus. Of course, what a big week, those 32 hours of power for central bank decisions. We'll be speaking with Moody's Analytics as well as a former BOJ board member. Plus, Goldman Sachs joining us from the market opens. We get an update on the APAC air travel situation as well with the Regional Aviation Association. We're also taking a look at uh, live pictures out of Caracas at the moment after polls in Venezuela closed. For the first time in more than a decade, Venezuelans are hopeful about getting a chance at democracy or awaiting those results of the presidential elections. We've been told that the government has uh, promised results by, if you're watching out of Hong Kong, that's 10 a.m. Hong Kong time. Uh, polling stations do have to remain open if people are still in line, though. So late Sunday night for the results of what has been a tense and dramatic presidential race. Nicolas Madero, of course, an 11-year group on power, uh, has been seen as one of the worst humanitarian and economic crises in modern history has been running for re-election against a candidate who hasn't even been on the ballot. We'll bring you those results as they come to us. This is Bloomberg. Decides. Who said summers were quiet? I don't remember the last quiet summer. We're talking about the data not being as accurate during this time of year. An election that's haywire. Trust Bloomberg to bring you the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis, including Powell's press conference. Is the answer here, Jeff, that everything is just plain solid? It's pretty solid, Tom. At some point, we got to call it a soft lead. Tune in to Bloomberg Surveillance, The Fed Decides, starting at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Let's take a look at the week ahead, and it is a big week for central bank decisions. That might be understating it a bit. Jay Powell uh, expected to signal that the Fed is on the verge of lowering borrowing costs within months, as says job growth in the U.S. moderates investors. See the Fed keeping rates at over that two-decade high, though, on Wednesday, and then delivering a cut come September. Uh, and, of course, in this part of the world, the Bank of Japan is set to be this week's highlight for Asia. Most economists see chances of a rate hike, although only three out of ten have that as their base case. Details of a plan to cut monthly bond purchases will also be closely watched. Over in the UK, the possibility of the Bank of England kicking off policy easing appears to be on a knife edge. Investors are betting on a 50% probability of a 25 basis point cut on Thursday. A lot going on. Let's bring in for some analysis. Katrina L, who's a director of economic research at Moody's Analytics. And Katrina, it, 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 first of all, it comes down to the Fed, right, because that's going to really change or potentially hold uh, the implications and the scenarios for every other central bank around the world. What's your view at the moment in terms of the balance of risks? Because there's been plenty of, you know, former Fed speakers, certainly economists, who say that they perhaps should have cut already or they should go now. Yeah, it's an interesting kind of conundrum that we're in at the moment because the Federal Reserve has indicated that they are being data-driven. So as a result of that, we are really um, on this 
you know, swings and roundabout type situation when it comes to every single kind of monthly data point that's a key, uh, you know, a key input into monetary policy decision making. So what we saw um, data last week showed that core PCE, which is the Fed's kind of preferred measure of inflation, that did, um, you know, come in at 2.6 percent in June, which really did allow us to, to breathe a sigh of relief that inflation is heading down in the, the right kind of way that we want it to. And as a result, it is really making sure that conditions are ripe for that rate cut in September. But you're exactly right. I mean, it there is that kind of issue that because we are being data driven, the data does come in with a lag. So we don't quite know where the employment, inflation, broader economic impacts are as a result of these tight monetary policy conditions. How difficult is the political uncertainty too, right? Because if, for example, we do end up with uh, another Trump presidency, some of these pro-growth, some of these you know, trade and tariff-related positioning, surely that would be seen as being inflationary as well. Does that kind of have to factor into the thinking at this point? So I think what the Fed is looking at right now is more the, the data here and now and how the economy is digesting um, that, that earlier monetary policy tightening. And so I think that's what they're focused on. But certainly looking forward, um, you know, the possibility of a Trump presidency 2.0 does need to factor into what future policy paths would be. I mean, particularly from a geopolitical standpoint, you know, we know that the relationship between US and China is really front and centre in the, the Trump side of things policy. And we know that that relationship and the threat of tariffs will have inflationary impacts in the US. But at this point, I think the Fed is really focusing on, on what's happening now with, with the data and with the economy. They can't, you know, forecast the, the political side of things too much. Uh, and of course, all of this has carried through for Asia, in particular for the Bank of Japan. In some ways, it'll be easier if the Fed sort of uh, positioning was clearer for the BOJ, right? Is it still too early when you take a look at the path through when it comes to wage growth to be able to see confidence in the BOJ being able to tighten? Oh, I think it's a really difficult position that the Bank of Japan is in, unfortunately. I mean, on the one hand, they're dealing with uh, a weak yen. We have seen some sort of, you know, strength recently, but overall the yen is incredibly weak. And that's balancing off the fact that domestic demand, particularly household consumption, is, is weak. So it's not really kind of the, the right sort of conditions from a domestic point of view to be hiking rates. But at the same time, they are wanting to, to stabilise that FX position. And signalling a, a tighter monetary policy stance does certainly help that. And I'm sure, you know, the BOJ was also breathing a sigh of relief when they got that uh, you know, weaker inflation print coming out of the U.S. because it does mean that the, the uh, easing cycle for the U.S. is coming sooner rather than later. Katrina, there are lots of sort of, you know, demographic challenges for Japan, right, beyond kind of what we're seeing in terms of the attempt to get back into this virtual cycle of inflation uh, and, and growth. We have seen the statistics when it comes to the, the drop in the population, of course, the ageing issues for the population as well. Longer term, are there sort of greater structural challenges here? Oh, definitely. And you know what? I think that's why the yen has, has really been hammered so much recently, because at, on the one hand, you know, finally, the Bank of Japan is hiking rates. But at the same time, they actually haven't achieved that that virtuous cycle of, of rising inflation, rising wages, rising consumption. I mean, it at the end of the day, what's happening with inflation is it's largely been driven by supply side factors and offshore supply side factors. Recently, we've seen a bit of movement with the CPI as a result of, you know, energy subsidies changes. So it's not really the type of inflation that's wanting to be delivered. And at the same time, now we're starting to see that the Bank of Japan hike rates. And at the same time, it's, it's problematic because domestic demand isn't quite where we need it to be. So it's kind of, you know, a bit of loss of faith in the economy that it's going to actually get out of its perennial stagnation, unfortunately. And I mean, we haven't seen a great start to the year. We saw a contraction in, in Q1. So incredibly kind of weak figures coming there. And unfortunately, we're not going to see much growth this year, if at all. Katrina, always great to have you with us ahead of a big week. Katrina L, Director of Economic Research at Moody's Analytics. Much more ahead on the age of trade. This is Bloomberg.
Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has reshuffled senior minister roles as he prepares for a tough election that must be held in the next 10 months. For more, let's bring in our Australian government reporter, Ben Westcott. And, you know, certainly here in Australia, maybe not in the US, 10 months is an eternity away when it comes to political time, right? This cabinet, uh, this government has been pretty stable going into sort of the current events. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and as Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has been very happy to point out, uh, in the last after the last change of government in 2013, the new Prime Minister Tony Abbott didn't even survive two years before he was booted out of his position. Mm -hmm. So, in comparison, uh, Albanese is doing pretty well. Um, but yes, this has been a very stable government. There's been no major ministerial changes up until now. This is the first major reshuffle, and what we've seen is really an emphasis on those portfolios that are going to be major. Um, points at the upcoming election. So we've seen big changes to the leadership of the immigration and home affairs portfolios uh, with uh, former uh, employment and industrial relations minister Tony Burke moving into the home affairs and immigration portfolio. And migration is going to be very, very big at this election with uh, high post-COVID levels of migration causing some uh, political uneasiness in the community. And then similarly, we've seen Claire O'Neill, former home affairs minister, shifted sideways into housing. Uh, which is uh, she's seen as a rising Labor star and housing is going to be a very, very important issue at this election with the national housing crisis uh, irritating Australians no end uh, over the next uh, 12 months. The housing crisis, the cost of living crisis, elevated interest rates, it's a pretty tough sort of backdrop for, for any government to be uh, operating in. How, how is the government faring when it comes to you know, opinion polls and is there a chance maybe that we could head to the polls early? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, currently the government is uh, either just a little ahead or a little behind the uh, centre-right op coalition opposition parties, depending on what poll you're reading. Um, while most people in the government, you know, in private conversations make it clear that they're pretty happy about the position they're in, there's no doubt that it's, uh, it's it could be a bit of a knife-edge style election. Um, but what's really going to decide that, and this is obviously something very relevant to us, is uh, the upcoming uh, inflation data, which is out on Wednesday for the second quarter. Uh, now, a particularly uh, strong result, so um, a faster drop in inflation than inspected, uh, could uh, lead to expectations of rate cuts later this year and make uh, the Prime Minister weigh an early election to try and capitalise on the goodwill from that. However, if we see much worse inflation uh, and uh, stickier, longer cost of living problems, then the government might want to wait it out for as long as it possibly can in the hope that we get a rate cut maybe early next year. Australian government reporter Ben Westcott. We're going to stick with politics and, of course, waiting for uh, the results of the presidential election out of Venezuela. We are taking a, a look at uh, sort of the state of affairs when it comes to uh, Caracas at the moment. And we are hearing the opposition candidate, they're speaking at the press conference saying that the elections this time, the turnout has been uh, massive. We have seen, of course, this 11-year hold by Nicolas Maduro uh, in terms of government criticised as one of the worst humanitarian and economic crises in modern history. He's been running for re-election against uh, a candidate who wasn't even on the ballot. So we've seen, of course, a former lawmaker, Maria Corina Machado, uh, has risen in terms of popularity. This is Bloomberg. This is the Asia Trade. We're about 30 minutes away from the major market opens, and these are the top stories that you need to know. Oil is in focus as Israel attacked Hezbollah targets in response to a rocket attack that killed 12 children and teenagers in Golan Heights. It comes as Israel signaled openness to a proposed truce with Gaza. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is zeroing in on a group of potential running mates as she faces a two-week dash to make a decision. Bloomberg's learned that a shortlist has emerged, including three elected officials with nationwide appeal. Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro and Minnesota Governor Tim Maltz. And Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni has pledged to relaunch bilateral cooperation with China as she began her first official visit to Beijing. It comes after Italy pulled out of that Belt and Road initiative last year. 
Let's get some more on this. Our China correspondent Min Min Lo joins us now in Hong Kong. So Min Min, uh, what has come out of Maloney's visit so far and are, ex are we expecting sort of any deliverables? Yes, it's been quite a nuanced relationship that Maloney is trying to achieve here because, as you said, they have pulled out of that Belt and Road initiative last year under U.S. pressure. Maloney previously said that the Belt and Road was a serious mistake that did not benefit Italy. But now the two sides have signed an agreement, a three-year action plan to strengthen collaboration in areas like trade and investment, education, uh, as well as environmental protection and food security. And this comes as she tries to normalize relations here, uh, Italy views Chinese investment as a way to spur Italy's anemic economic growth. We know that the Italian government has been in talks with Chinese automakers to invest in Italy to open up plants and at the same time the sustainability of Italian exports to China also rests on the strength of bilateral relations here. The two sides still have annual trade of about 80, 80 billion dollars a year that is tilted heavily in China's favor. And then those EV tariffs also in focus as Italy had supported those EU tariffs on China and uh, Beijing likely to use this trip to try to carve out more negotiation room ahead of that November deadline when the final tariffs will be decided. Maloney is going to meet with President Xi today where she's expected to raise the issue of Ukraine as well. Sources tell us that Maloney views President Xi Jinping as an important stakeholder in this conversation, especially in the event of a Trump presidency that could see Washington potentially cut off support for Ukraine. And we know that, you know, when it comes to whether it's Trump or Harris in the White House post January, the pushback on these overcapacity claims for Beijing will continue. Now, we've heard this uh, sort of, uh, I guess, retort from Beijing, right, from the Vice Finance Minister against US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's latest criticism of the industrial excess and, and investment in the EVs in particular. That's right. Beijing has hit back with multiple arguments. The vice finance minister saying that, number one, China is a public force for good. It is a contribution to disinflation when China can produce goods that are value for money. And number two, it contributes to climate change. It helps those countries that are trying to achieve carbon reduction by 2030 when the projection for demand for new energy vehicles in 2030 still outstrips the current supply. He denied that the current capacity strength from China is coming from government subsidies. Instead, he said there are many other factors, including corporate investment into R&D, innovation, entrepreneurship. He said the reason why some other countries have uh, been left out of this EV race is because they had enjoyed advantages in the traditional auto manufacturing sector, and so they had not sought to seek out um, other new growth areas. But China did the opposite. It sought new growth growth areas because it did not enjoy advantages in the traditional growth areas. And he said it's not uncommon for there to be huge capital inflows into new growth areas, citing examples like IT, shale gas, biopharma, and how that had led to temporary overcapacity in other developed countries before. And he said it's natural for there to be these uh, disequilibrium in the market because companies choose what to invest in based, based on their own projections of future demand and supply and only market forces can tell us who's right and wrong in the end. The Vex China correspondent Min Min Lo there. Uh, another story that we're following when it comes to China and state media there say at least 12 people were killed after a house collapsed in a landslide in Hunan province as heavy rainfall continued over the weekend. A city in the northeast also issued an emergency flood warning while some 27,000 residents were relocated in Liaoning province. Beijing has allocated an extra $67 million in disaster relief for regions that have been battered by weeks of torrential rain. We'll take a look at how we're setting up into what is a huge week for central banks. That 32-hour window where we'll see particular decisions from the Fed and the Bank of Japan. A lot riding on in particular the latter. The Fed is largely expected to wait until September, uh, but there are uh, sort of building risks that we'll see that rate hike from the Bank of Japan and the implications for, of course, the unwinding of that bullish yen trend that we've seen over the last few trading sessions. Uh, it is looking like we'll follow the lead that we saw in the Wall Street session, though, equity 
equity futures uh, positioned up by about eight tenths of one percent here in Australia. Also, really popping when it comes to trading in Singapore. Nikkei futures up by almost two percent there, and we're seeing early gains when it comes to uh, Hong Kong as well. The bets that uh, the Fed will ease sooner or later, probably sooner, will really helping fuel corporate earnings was a narrative that investors were piling back into. Of course, after what has been a significant sell-off across the tech space, uh, tech stocks there, the Nasdaq 100 still really on the cusp of that correction. S and P futures more broadly, though, seeing a little bit of upside in the early part of the futures trading session. We've also got the Bank of England rate decision to look ahead to this week as well. Well, much more ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. Well, the U.S. has pledged to bring the full force of its military to defend Japan and South Korea. This is defense ministers from the three countries signed a deal formalizing plans for a regular, uh, regular military training and defense talks. Our East Asia government editor, John Herskovitz, joins us now for more. Uh, and, of course, you know, the formalization of this agreement where we know that a lot of these exercises are taking place already, uh, it was a significant meeting for a number of reasons. What's the sort of scenario that they're looking at here in terms of a potential conflict? Sure, I mean, it's, we've had the threat for years because we have two of the world's largest military forces lined up at the border. And the risk to the economy, of both in South Korea and the world, are just enormous. The uh, study by Bloomberg Economics just put a figure on this about the $4 trillion. They're saying that the hit could be devastating. And it, this would uh, affect things from, a, yeah, from chip production to shipping and the risk have always been there, and uh, they've only grown as uh, the North Korea's nuclear arsenal has gotten bigger. And Kim Jong-un has reiterated that he has the right to annihilate South Korea if he chooses, if he feels the threat is there. So the risk have been going on for some time. Some analysts have said they've gotten larger since the year began as Kim's rhetoric has gotten more heated. And the risks might sort of be elevated going into the U.S. election, right? What are we seeing are the risks to civilians and, and the economic risks as well? Uh, sure. I mean, if um, we had an interview yesterday with uh, South Korea's defense minister who said that North Korea could be looking at a nuclear test to coincide with the U.S. election. And the risk to South Korea are not only from nuclear, they're also from conventional weapons. Now, if you take a look at South Korea's population, about half the population lives in the Seoul area, and most of the economy, chip production, are there as well. So if there were to be a conflict, the cost for the human toll would be enormous, the economic toll would be enormous, and the, this area is within artillery range of North Korea, and the artillery positions have been there for decades. They're well established. And North Korea could fire off tens of thousands of rounds of munitions before South Korea and the U.S. could really come back and retaliate and try to knock out some of these positions. So we have uh, about uh, 26 million people in the Seoul area. We have uh, the most of its economy and about a, th a third of all chip production is in that area. Our East Asia government editor John Herskovitz there. Uh, all Japanese markets will open for cash trading at the top of the next hour. Take a look at how we're trading when it comes to the yen as well as JGB and equity futures. And the big question really is the yen, right? Even with spots markets really pretty firmly pricing in, uh, the likelihood of a BOJ rate hike, and in fact, a 70% is what we're seeing when it comes to swap market pricing. The question is whether that's going to be even enough to carry through that extension of the July rally in the yen. It was a pretty sort of savage turnaround when it comes to uh, that short yen trade and the unwinding of a lot of these uh, positions last week, particularly with the big implications on other carry trades as well. We're also watching uh, futures, equity futures looking like they will follow on the US, but of course a big question mark when it comes to the Japanese bond market as well. Let's bring in our next guest who actually doesn't expect the Bank of Japan to hike rates this week. With us now is Takahide Kuchi, executive economist on, from the Nomura Research Institute. He 
previously served as a board member at the BOJ. Uh, Taki, it's really great to have you with us again. And it's interesting because there are two, two sides to the story, right? One would be what the data is showing. As you rightly point out, the path through when it comes to wage gains uh, is perhaps not quite there yet. There is still quite a bit of market pressure, though, uh, in terms of the expectations that have been built uh, from banks, uh, from yen traders. You know, which is the prevailing force here for the Bank of Japan? Yeah, you know that uh, uh, at the meeting of this week, uh, BOJ uh, will release that uh, uh, JDB uh, purchase reduction plan. But financial market is concerning that the, whether that the BOJ will increase the interest rate uh, at the same time. And the market view is divided, but I myself expect that the BOJ will not increase the interest rate and the increase in September meetings uh, because that, uh, uh, it's risky for that the BOJ to change that, uh, to, to implement uh, two large uh, policy change at the same time. That could uh, destabilize the financial market. And also that the recent economic data, particularly that the consumption uh, data is uh, uh, exceptionally weak. Uh, under that economic condition, BOJ will not rush to uh, increase the interest rate. So I think that the market view is uh, divided, but if that the BOJ uh, will not increase the interest rate uh, at the meeting of this week, uh, I think that that's caused some uh, weakness in the currency market. However, I think that trend of the yen is already changing to that uh, appreciation uh, directions, uh, mainly because of that uh, uh, possible rate cut by uh, Federal Reserve uh, rather than that uh, possible increase of uh, interest rate by Bank of Japan. I think that the yen is entering that uh, uh, long-lasting uh, appreciation trend. I expect that the yen to reach uh, 145 against dollars at the end of this uh, year. And uh, that could eventually reach that 115, at, uh, it, that is an uh, equivalent level against dollars in the coming uh, several years. Uh, sorry, I, let me clarify. Where do you see the 115 and what sort of policy divergence would you need to see for that to happen? Yeah, I think it takes time that the uh, uh, yen could uh, recover, uh, re uh, uh, yen could uh, reach that equivalent level at the 115. I think that uh, it could take uh, uh, several years. Uh, because of the long lasting easy, easing monetary policy of the Bank of Japan under that very high inflation rate, that, that increased the inflation expectation for the household and the financial market. And this kind of uh, increase of the, the inflation expectation undermined the consumption on the one hand. But on the other hand, uh, that could cause uh, the sharp yen depreciation and increase at the equity price. So Japanese economy is facing that kind of two-tier uh, system, uh, very strong uh, corporate profit and increase by equity price, and uh, very weak consumptions. So if that the yen starts to appreciate, uh, I think that the uh, two-tier situation could be changed and the Japan's economy, Japanese consumption may restore that uh, uh, <clears throat> solidness. So I think that the BOJ's monetary policy eventually leads to that the normalization of the Japanese economy. So I, I think that the, uh, in this sense, I think that the BOJ's uh, normalization monetary policy increase of interest rate could be uh, justified. But uh, Bank of Japan is not... Uh, rush to increase the interest at, at this moment because that uh, uh, consumption is weak and uh, also that there's some pressure from the political side. I think that the government wants BOJ to stop that yen depreciation. But on the other hand, uh, government or politicians uh, wants BOJ to increase the interest rate at this moment because that could uh, cause some uh, negative impact to that the consumer sentiment. So I think that... Uh, uh, Government is uh, sending that this kind of two conflicting uh, requests to the Bank of Japan. One solution is reduction of JGB purchase. That is not the increase of interest rate, but that could have some impact to that uh, uh, stabilizing that currency market. You, you characterize uh, consumption as, as exceptionally weak, right? Is this the biggest risk to be able to re-enter or sort of reignite that so-called virtuous cycle? And what, what other risks do you feel at this point might be jeopardizing that? Mm, yeah, I don't think that uh, uh, there's such kind of large risk 
because at the uh, weakness of that consumption could be a temporary event. It's caused by that uh, sharp uh, increase of interest, uh, sharp increase of the prices, and as I said, that uh, uh, even under the high inflation rate, BOJ has has been keeping that uh, low interest rate for a long time. That's allowed that the increase of uh, inflation expectation for households. That's a reason behind that uh, exceptional weakness of consumption. But if that the normalization monetary policy of Bank of Japan and the Federal Reserve Board at the same time uh, calls that the yen appreciation, so I think that the appreciation of yen could uh, reduce that the concern for that the higher prices in the long term, and that could have a positive impact to that consumption. So if that the yen appreciate. Uh, gradually, I think that we can expect that some recovery of the consumption uh, by the end of this uh, year. But the risk scenario is uh, if the yen appreciate very rapidly uh, with a uh, 20 or 25 percent uh, per year pace, uh, that could undermine that uh, corporate profit and uh, reduce that uh, uh, equity price and undermine that consumer sentiment. So that could be a risk scenario. Maybe gradual yen appreciation could be a positive for that consumption and the Japanese economy, but the sharp yen appreciation could be counter, uh, counterproductive to the Japanese economy. I think that the normalization by the policy by Bank of Japan will not cause that sharp yen appreciation, but uh, maybe unexpected weakness of that U.S. economy and uh, sharp rate cut by Federal Reserve Board, or uh, uh, dollar depreciation policy by uh, Mr. Trump in case of that re his re-election, uh, such policy could cause that the sharp yen uh, appreciation and undermine the Japanese uh, economy. I think that the maybe wide, wide uh, card of that the economy, Japanese economy and the currency market exists in the uh, uh, U.S. side. Mm. Takeda, I wanted to get your view on the data that was out over the weekend from the Internal Affairs Department about the big drop, in fact, the single biggest drop in the population that we've seen, right, over 860,000 people of a decline, about seven-tenths of a percent on a year. These sort of demographic changes or challenges, I should say, how does that factor into the age-wage profile and, and, and forward-looking productivity and, and growth? Yeah, I think that's a big, big challenge for the Japanese economy, and uh, that it's not a uh, uh, unique uh, event in Japan, but it's uh, uh, maybe that uh, uh, we can see that uh, in many countries in Asia. Uh, but in case of Japan, I think that the uh, decline of population could undermine that the uh, productivity growth rate and the potential growth rate. So that could undermine that the Japanese economy. So if that the giant trend of that the population may continue, and the decline of the birth rate may continue. I think that the potential growth rate uh, may decline further, and uh, that could increase at the deflationary pressures again. So government uh, recently uh, implemented a policy uh, to, to tackle with that the decline population problem, but I think that the uh, uh, policy is not enough. That is just a substitute to that the, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, mm. the pe uh, coupled peoples. But uh, I think that one of the reasons behind that the sharp decline of population rate or birth rate is that the decline of uh, marriage rate. Government has no plan for that mm. uh, increase at the marriage rate. And on the other hand, I think that uh, we need to, uh, uh, how to say, utilize that the uh, foreign right. workers. So that could be uh, one important solution. But I think that some uh, conservative group of that the LDP ruling party is still, still against that mm -hmm. uh, change of that immigration law. But uh, I think that the uh, accepting more foreign workers from right. abroad could be uh, very important. But the uh, yen depreciation could be a uh, one obstacle for that uh, 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 accepting <laughs> that uh, foreign workers. So in, in light of this, I, also in light of this, I think that the question yeah. of that the yen depreciation is very important. Takehide, really great to have you with us and your insights. Takehide Kiyuchi, who's an executive economist at the Nomura Research Institute. More ahead, this is Bloomberg. when it comes to earnings from Japanese banks. Our Asia Investing Editor, Russell Ward, joins us for a preview. So, Russell, this is kind of the first period that fully reflects the end of negative rates. What are we expecting from the mega banks? 
Morning, Heidi. Yeah, very busy earnings period ahead. Um, for the mega banks, remember uh, they're forecasting record profit this fiscal year, so this will be the first uh, quarter uh, to assess their progress towards those goals, and I think probably we'll see some solid progress on that front. Uh, but as you mentioned, it's also the first uh, quarter where they are in a post-negative interest rate world. So, you know, banks have been longing for this for a long time. So. It'll be really interesting to see how the banks benefit from that uh, and how it might lift uh, net interest income. So, you know, that'll be cl one close thing to watch. Another thing to watch is uh, perhaps gains from um, sales across shareholdings. Uh, banks are just about to embark on a fresh round of, of uh, cutting these uh, strategic shareholdings and client companies and companies like Toyota. It's at a very early stage at this point, but. Um, Expect to see some gains from those sales as well. Uh, and then the other thing uh, that the banks are probably going to benefit from is uh, an uptick in fee business uh, because of the buoyant financial markets here in Japan, the stock and the bond markets. Uh, so that, would have, that will help their uh, investment banking side as well. So there might be a little bit of noise in the results uh, with the MUFG and Mizuho having uh, large one time gains a year earlier. So their profit may actually fall uh, on a year on year basis. But uh, I think the overall uh, progress towards the, uh, the Record profit targets is uh, the key thing to keep in mind, and uh, that, that should be solid. And some of those brokerage units of those banks might have a bit more pressure. Are the expectations more mixed when it comes to brokers? Actually, I mean, the brokers uh, have uh, have a lot of tailwinds. Uh, so we're going to see Nomura's results tomorrow. Uh, they've... Uh, the bank, the brokerages have uh, benefited from buoyant markets. Uh, you know, the stock market hitting a record this year. JGB market has been, um, has you know, come back to life uh, in the wake of the scrapping of the negative interest rate policy. Uh, and also, Japanese brokerages have actually benefited from some reasonably um, strong uh, deal-making activity. Uh, the ECM market um, uh, here in Tokyo is, is pretty robust uh, on that front too. So, and of course, we saw um, very strong trading results uh, on Wall Street and also some a pickup in deal-making results there as well. So it'll be interesting to see how Nomura fits in and whether it kept up uh, with uh, the solid results there on Wall Street as well. But, um, you know, it's a busy week ahead and um, we'll have to see how it all pans out. <laughs> Busy week in so many ways for Japan. Russell Ward, there, our investing editor. Our market opens are next. This is Bloomberg. This is the Asia Trade. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. And Paul, uh, 32 hours of central bank power is what we're looking ahead to, right? A lot of event risk uh, for investors to be con contending with. But, you know, so many of these expectations are kind of in stone. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's an expectation the BOJ might move, but it's certainly not the consensus. Mm. And uh, as to the Fed, well, September looking more likely, but you know, it could be a week of real surprises, definitely the major catalyst. Yeah, and you know, we were speaking to um, one economist earlier who's saying there are lots of reasons for Japan to potentially wait, the Bank of Japan to potentially wait. Uh, what does that mean when it comes to a potential further strengthening the yen after that trade just got c completely ravaged, right? The short yen trade that is in the previous week, uh, or that could potentially even worsen. Let's take a look at the open. We'll get you straight to the open here in uh, Japan first off, and we have seen in future looking pretty kind of perky following those uh, sort of the rally that we did see, the recovery rally really on Wall Street on Friday. The Nikkei 225 off by uh, just about one and a quarter of one percent in the first few minutes of trade. They're also seeing some strength there for the topics. A lot of this coming back off, you know, what was some really extraordinarily harsh losses, particularly across the tech space in the US session that carried through to here in Asia. So we'll be watching in particular whether we see a true recovery for those AI and chip related names that uh, saw so much damage in the last few sessions. We're looking dollar yen holding pretty steady at 154 16, whether that stays that way, um, really so much is depending on what the Fed does and what the Bank of Japan comes through with if that rate hike comes through, if they'll choose to wait, uh, as are expectations for the Fed until September and implications obviously for the JGB market as well. Switching out the board to take a look at the Cosby. 
Africa. And of course, this is really another market that was battered by that tech sell-off that we saw that started in the US. It cost me uh, by just about six-tenths of one percent at this point. Uh, we're watching kind of the potential next move when it comes to the one as well, looking to the upturn that we've seen in exports. It's really emerging Asia's worst performing currency this year. But we could see, according to some strategists, a bit of a rebound as both local and external factors start to perhaps turn in the one's favour. Uh, Natixis as well as Kukmin Bank are two of those banks that expect the one to strengthen by at least 2% going into the end of the year. Again, Fed rate cuts is a big driver there, Paul. Yeah, let's uh, take a look at what's happening in Australia. Of course, we've just opened for trade here, staggered open naturally, but uh, we're off to a reasonably bright start at the moment, better by three quarters of 1%. A couple of stocks we've been watching as well. Uh, okay, I beg your pardon, it's ANZ that's up to three quarters of 1%. We're, of course, watching that uh, due to multiple investigations into contact, uh, misconduct, bonds dealing as well. And we take a look at BHP, also up half of 1% in the early going. Uh, of course, wage negotiations underway with BHP for workers at its Escondida mine. Uh, uh, yields also moving lower. The yield on the 10-year 4.19 as we've been discussing a lot of central bank action this week. Also central bank action coming up in Australia next week and we've got CPI numbers uh, coming out this month. That is going to be critical as to whether the next move from the RBA could be tightening. Brent there also showing some gains. Of course, uh, a lot of tension in the Middle East. We'll talk about that in a moment as well, Heidi. Yeah, there's certainly a lot going on, a lot of cross currents for these markets. Right, let's bring in to kind of make some sense out of all this. Sunil Cool is the APAC equity strategist at Goldman Sachs. Sunil, really great to have you with us. So if you're talking about this sort of, you know, frenzy of central bank decisions and the implications on where the markets go from here, what are your expectations, first off, going into the Fed and the BOJ? Yeah, look, I mean, we do think, uh, for example, case of Fed, uh, we would see rate cut cycle finally starting. We're kind of baking in uh, two cuts uh, into our forecast this year, September and December. Um, I mean, for BOJ uh, this week, uh, we think they will sort of raise policy rates to 50 basis points and also announce uh, uh, some uh, sort of reduction in the purchases of JGBs from six trillion uh, per month uh, to around three trillion per month over the next two, uh, two years. But I think with re regards to uh, Fed, Heidi, I think the fact that uh, disinflation trends are in, in back in place, you're going to see Fed cuts finally starting through. That ideally should be good for Asian markets, EM markets, that should be good for fund flows uh, in general. But I think over the next uh, few months, uh, we probably would see more volatility around the U.S. election, and that probably would be more front and center, which is why we think overall markets may still be choppy uh, over the next few months, despite the fact that Fed is going to ease pretty soon. There's been some of that volatility spillover into EM as well. So do you think regardless of what the Fed does, perhaps even regardless of the results in November from the US election, that this rotation, de-risking uh, trade that we've started to see perhaps continues? Um, look, I think part of it could continue because uh, you do need um, sort of guidance from the sort of US megatech companies uh, to, to sort of at least uh, sort of have some have some, some confidence in there. I think what, what's really happening is that people are generally, um, we are generally seeing an unwind of popular trades across markets, right? And we, so we saw that with, with Yen, we saw that briefly with the, with the CNS shorts in that. We saw that in the tech hardware space as well. And so I think people are generally de-risking heading into the elections. And we do, um, despite sort of fundamentals, because in, in many cases, we actually had decent earnings, especially in the Asian Asian bit. But still we saw sort of people sort of uh, taking, taking risk off. So I think that will probably continue until the elections and uh, and then maybe we could see a, sta a bit of stabilization in, in that depending on what the outcome for the, for the elections would be. Well we do have some more big tech earnings this week of course there's Microsoft, Apple, Amazon reporting. Uh, what do you expect to see here and is it going to be enough to prevent uh, that tech inspired sell-off uh, regaining momentum? Uh, look I think markets uh, could stabilize uh, sort of post the elections. But I think if you sort of look at the global equities, uh, Paul, we actually have taken a more neutral view on, on global equities just on the back of sort of uh, increased uh, potentially geopolitical tensions and election related volatility. So in, in general, our sense is that for the next few months, it will still be choppy. And so you want to kind of lean much more defensive, um, both in sort of equities, but sort of general kind of across markets. And so um, so I think post the election, depending on the on the outcome, uh, we would be looking to sort of scale up, uh, scale up risk. 
you seem very focused on what happens after November. In that regard, do you have any concerns about inflation reigniting in 2025 uh, due to the spending plans of uh, both the uh, major parties in the U.S.? Uh, I mean, look, I think in our own forecast, we do think that disinflation trends broadly continue. And, and so you get inflation more closer to, to what the Fed wants it to be. Um, again, I think there is a huge uh, uncertainty in terms of what comes out, uh, when does the spending happen, if there are any sort of policy announcements around tariffs and all of that. So at this at this juncture, we aren't sort of in expecting any huge increase in inflation, which is why we think Fed will continue not cutting this year, September and December, but also we are baking in quarterly Fed cuts into into next year. Um, so we don't think there is a there's a huge risk to inflation coming back uh, uh, in in our forecast at the moment. So I wanted to ask you about China. Is this a market that's compelling at all, sort of even selectively? I mean, for sure. Look, I mean, I think uh, even from the broad market perspective, I mean, we obviously have seen uh, post the plenum some sort of obviously more policy easing. I mean, the market is back to trading sub nine times uh, forward PE positioning, as we know, is, is pretty cheap. And so there is a tactical case for market to do well. Um, again, I think in, in, the, in the event of the sort of the uh, U.S. elections, it's hard for, for, for seeing a stronger rally. But in general, to your point, Heidi, there are chances that the selectively pockets of the market could continue to do well. We still like the broad uh, <clears throat> sort of theme of uh, shareholder reforms in in China, which sort of subdivides into a couple of pockets, but that will include some of the sort of high dividend name, name cash cows in the market that include some of the, some of the uh, uh, stocks where potentially uh, dividend payments are low and, and they have high cash flows. So there could be some sort of surprise candidates and buyback candidates there that also include some of the SOEs, which we think would be encouraged to increase dividends. So the, the entire shareholding reform theme we think could continue to do well. Um, then I think over the next sort of three, three months, as we had into November, you could also see um, domestic cyclicals or domestic pockets of the market do much better than U.S. sort of exporters. Um, and also from a currency standpoint, if there is kind of more weakness in, in, in currency, you could see RMB depreciation uh, beneficiaries do much better. So you could still see kind of pockets of the market do, do, do better uh, even, even over the next few months in China. And then obviously we do expect policy uh, to, to ease further. Uh, both in terms of more government bond issuance, but also in terms of more easing to come through in coming months. That should be supportive for the markets as well. Uh, Sunil, uh, just before we let you go, um, we're watching closely tension in the Middle East at the moment. Uh, what's your outlook for the oil price? Do you have any concerns that the uh, conflict might escalate, might widen? Look, I think oil uh, on the oil, we still have a range-bound view on oil, kind of oil broadly sticking between kind of 70 to 90 dollars. So, uh, so I think as long as that continues to to play out, um, we, we we think it should be sort of okay backdrop for the overall sort of equity markets. But I think as I, as I said, I mean. Or there, there could be potentially um, higher geopolitical risk, but I think there is also, as we just uh, uh, sort of discussed, heightened geopolitical risk in the, in the next few months. I mean, all of that sort of point, point points to being generally more conservative on, on, on risk over the next few months, and we see how that, how that plays out. All right. all right, Sunil Cole, APAC Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. Thanks so much for joining us. We have more to come on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. Who said summers were quiet? I don't remember the last quiet summer. We're talking about the data not being as accurate during this time of year. An election that's haywire. Trust Bloomberg to bring you the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis, including Powell's press conference. Is the answer here, Jeff, that everything is just plain solid? It's pretty solid, Tom. At some point, we got to call it a soft lead. Tune in to Bloomberg Surveillance. The Fed decides, starting at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. All right, let's take a look at oil prices at the moment. We've got Brent trading right now at 81.33. It's a little lower 
um, from where it was about an hour ago, but ticking up again as uh, we watch closely what's going on in the Middle East uh, with Israel threatening further military action after striking Hezbollah targets in Lebanon. And that's in response to a rocket attack that killed a dozen young people in the Israeli-occupied Golden Heights. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to exact a heavy price from Hezbollah, which has denied responsibility for the attack. So let's get more from Asia EcoGov editor Michael Heath. Michael, uh, just another depressingly familiar day in the Middle East, really, but with a twist. It appears that this conflict now uh, has a greater risk of widening. Uh, what are we watching for? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a real worry, Paul. I mean, this is what everyone has sort of been worrying about. Uh, Hezbollah is obviously a lot more powerful than Hamas, and they've been they've been trading blows these two since after, since just after um, Hamas's attack on Israel. But this um, this sort of escalates things quite dramatically. Obviously, 12 children killed, 20 injured. Um, the, the, it's been reported that the U.S. understands this is probably a mistake by Hezbollah, but no doubt Israel will re uh, retaliate heavily. It's just that that's what you have to do in the Middle East. The question then then comes is will Hezbollah retaliate again and that's when you see the escalation that's when you see the potential widening so that's what everyone will be watching for from here but um, yeah a really really nervous situation and um, particularly at a time when there was sort of talk or Netanyahu had been indicating that perhaps true steel was getting a bit closer now whether that was reality or just designed for the US audience uh, it, it's unclear at this point but yeah very very worrying situation for stability in the Middle East. The question is, you know, even though these talks continue when it comes to a ceasefire or perhaps some sort of truce, Hezbollah says they'll stop when the fighting stops in Gaza. Israel says they won't stop until they've wiped out Hamas. Um, the overlay of Iran as well was interesting kind of timing to, to hear the remarks from Ayatollah Khamenei in terms of wanting to improve relations mm, uh, with mm. the US or with the West more broadly? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can probably rule out the, the improvement of relations at this stage until, I mean, Iran has some sway over all of these proxies, obviously. It finances them, it arms them. Uh, and while you've got, you know, these sort of tragedies going on, no one's really going to be looking to, to improve ties with Iran, particularly its supplying uh, of Russia as well. But, um, yeah, the, the, the truce is very, very hard to understand. I mean, they, it's almost intractable. I mean, Hamas is like, no truce until we're sure that this is the end of the war. Israel is like, um, you know, we're not signing anything unless we can keep going with the war. The, the question was, can it be fudged? Um, and the US and, and Europe and, and the West would really like to see the, the, a truce as the starting point for an end to the war. Um, and that's where they're sort of looking at. Can they, can they find a, a language that keeps the door open to Israel if it needs to, but, but will reassure everyone but that the big drive is sort of to try to bring this to an end now? I mean, it's been going on for 10 months. Those hostages have been underground for a long period of time. Some of them, have, or, or quite a few of them, have died. So we're really sort of at a, at a point where it has to happen if those people are going to be saved, really. Oh, Asia Economy and Government Editor Michael Heath there with the latest. Bloomberg has learnt that US Vice President Kamala Harris is zeroing in on a potential group of potential running mates. For more, let's bring our breaking news managing editor Derek Wallbank. So, Derek, talk us through the top contenders. Sure, Heidi. You've got three names that are sort of emerging from a much larger field that are being vetted right now. I'll give you those three. One is Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, former astronaut, husband of Gabby Giffords. Uh, one is Josh Shapiro, governor of Pennsylvania, kind of rose up through the ranks of Pennsylvania government uh, bit by bit, uh, but somebody with incredibly high favorability ratings in what is seen as the most critical of the swing states. And then the third on the list, Minnesota Governor Tim Walls, highest ranking uh, enlisted man to serve in Congress, also a former school teacher uh, who, when he was in Congress, was in a red district or, or a, a purple district, uh, someone who has had to talk to, I think I would say this with all three, uh, people who have gotten to where they are in their careers from being able to get Republicans to cross over and vote for them as well. Uh, Kamala Harris has had a list of, let's say, maybe 12, 15 or so people that she's been vetting. These are three names that have come up. The pick has not been made yet that we know of, um, but it is expected to be made before uh, the 7th of, of uh, August. I would expect that this week is actually really in play for that. It may not stretch out all the way to the back end of there. It could be seen uh, this week. But these are the three names that have kind of emerged, bubbled up to the top of that list.
Um, we've also got to talk, Derek, about uh, the extraordinary fundraising Kamala Harris has uh, managed to achieve. 200 million in the first week. Uh, can that kind of momentum be sustained, though? Well, Paul, it's a great question. You know, I think that uh, one of the things that people had talked about with Harris is that she would be able to inherit this 90 plus million dollar uh, war chest. She has gone out and outraised that by double uh, in about a week. And that is just a staggering amount of money. If you sort of look at your screen, you can see uh, th this, uh, this, this giant uh, wave of money that came in right after she was in. Uh, this is. This is an amount of money that, you know, presidential campaigns in the U.S. are quite expensive, uh, but we're seeing some of the best days of the cycle so far, and Harris is stringing those back to back to back. Uh, so it's quite a big amount of windfall there for her. She needed to be able to bring this sort of infrastructure, some excitement uh, to the campaign. And, and I think that one of the things that you've seen is you've seen a rollout that is maybe as good as Democrats could have hoped for, even if it's one that they had not been able to plan for. She's risen in the polls. She has, and then you'd see that nationally as well as in swing states. Her favorability ratings are up from when she uh, when she became the Democratic presumptive nominee, which is uh, which is I think a really important test. And at the same time, Trump has kind of come down a little bit. Uh, that rollout of of his vice presidential pick, J.D. Vance, maybe not having gone so smoothly. They've been on defense about some of Vance's past comments, which leads into what I would say is is an increased pressure for Harris right now. Right. She has been a vice president. She is vice president right now. She knows how important this pick is. And it's not just vetting what are your financials, what are your conflicts of interest. It's what have you said before? What did you say on social media 10 years ago about insert issue here? J.D. Vance is finding this out the hard way. Kamala Harris's team is going to be going through every single one of the statements they, th they can possibly find from all of these guys because they just want to know what they're in for. All right, breaking news, managing editor Derek Wallbank there. More ahead on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. Polls have closed in Venezuela's largely peaceful and orderly presidential election. The opposition candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, says voter turnout was massive. Our Venezuela and Colombia bureau chief, Patricia Leo, joins us now for the latest as we continue to take a look at uh, the state of play when it comes to Caracas, of course, waiting for these results. And Patricia, you know, this was really quite an extraordinary election, this sort of chance that I guess democracy after Maduro's 11 year term of government. What are we expecting here? As you say, this elections, there's a lot of, there's very high stakes. Maduro has been in power for 11 years. Chavismo has ruled Venezuela for a quarter of a century. So right now we have both political camps claiming victory. Um, we are awaiting results, which Maduro has promised to have by 10 p.m. Uh, as of today, we've had a pretty calm and peaceful election day. We saw very large crowds in the early morning and those uh, dispersed as the day went on. But most voting centers are closed as of now. So just a lot of tension in the air, a lot of uncertainty, and we should have the results in the coming hours. So it's Edmundo Gonzalez's name on the ballot opposite Nicolas Maduro. But tell us about uh, Maria Corina Cur Machado. Uh, what role does she have to play in this process? Right. So Maria Corina Machado was the overwhelming winner of the opposition's primary last year. Uh, she's been in politics for a very long time. She's uh, she's a self-described uh, central liberalist, and uh, she was banned by the government for uh, running for public office until 2030. So after that happened, Edmundo Gonzalez was named as the stand-in candidate. So in fact, most of the people voting for Edmundo Gonzalez today are in fact supporting Maria Corina Machado is indeed an unusual situation that we have never seen before in a Venezuelan presidential election. 
so much focus on the transparency, the fairness of the vote and the result, right? We have the US sanctions, you know, as a result of what it says was a violation of a deal for free elections. How are we expecting that to play out? And do we expect that whatever the result is, that it will be, you know, accepted uh, calmly and fairly? We'll have to see. Obviously, I don't have the, the answer for that, but we do have uh, several international observers here, including a small mission from the Carter Center and from the UN. Um, Venezuela elections in the past have had a lot of accusations of fraud, of, of voter coercion, of vote tampering. Um, so we'll definitely have to, to hear from them to see what they analyze from today's election. We, we will hear from the Carter Center on Tuesday. Um, but as of today, the opposition has not yet declared any fraud. There's been very few sort of um, uh, accusations of irregularities at the voting center. So that's not really in play at the moment. Um, Patricia, you're talking about the large crowds there. How important is voter turnout uh, to this election, and particularly in terms of ensuring that uh, vote tampering is pushed to the sidelines? It's hugely important, and it's uh, become more and more important as Venezuela's exodus has increased. We know more than seven and a half million of Venezuelans have fled the country since 2015. So there's a very large population of Venezuelans uh, outside the country who are unable to vote today. Um, only those living in countries that have active diplomatic relations with Maduro, which are very few, were able to vote. So that is why uh, both camps were urging their, their voters to, to come out and vote. Um, some analysts say that a low turnout would favor Maduro, and of course, a lot of the, the Venezuelans who have fled the country are, would presumably vote for the opposition, so that it favors him as well. What is the economic challenge for whoever has this next six-year term? Huge. It's even hard to, to understand at this point. Venezuela had one of the biggest economic contractions in modern history. Um, Venezuela re relies so much on oil production that has been completely decimated by years of corruption, infrastructure that has not been invested in. Um, so whoever would come into power would have to do some serious work, not just to resuscitate the oil industry, but try to get the currency in check, keep, continue to keep inflation low. So it, without a doubt, it would be a huge challenge for whoever wins tonight. All right, Bloomberg's Bureau Chief for Venezuela and Colombia, Patricia Laya there. Let's take a look at uh, some of the movers in the early going here in Asia Pacific, uh, particularly focusing on uh, ASI. Uh, we've got shares falling there by 12 percent. This is after EU regulators rejected uh, its uh, Alzheimer's drug. So uh, ASI shares falling by 11 percent there. Uh, elsewhere, things reasonably risk on. Tokyo Steel better by 17 percent. All right, we have more to come in a moment on the Asia trade. Stay with us. This is Bloom. We're just about 30 minutes into the start of trading this Monday morning here in Asia. The top stories you should know. Oil is in focus in the session. Israel attacking Hezbollah targets in response to a rocket attack that killed 12 children and teenagers in Golan Heights. That's as Israel signaled an openness to a proposed truce in Gaza. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris is zeroing in on a group of potential running mates as she faces a two-week dash to make a decision. Bloomberg's learned that a shortlist has emerged, including three elected officials with nationwide appeal. Arizona Senator Mark Kelly, Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro and Minnesota Governor Tim Maltz. And Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney has pledged to relaunch bilateral cooperation with China as she began her first official visit to Beijing. Comes after Italy pulled out of the Belt and Road Initiative last year. Let's bring our China correspondent Min Min Lo, who joins us from Hong Kong. And Min Min, uh, what have we seen out of this visit so far and any deliverables to be looking out for? 
Yes, it's quite an interesting reset of relations that Maloney is trying to achieve here just months after pulling out of that Belt and Road Initiative under U.S. pressure. She had previously said that the BRI was a mistake and not beneficial to Italy, but now the two sides have signed a three-year action plan to expand cooperation in areas like trade and investment, education, food security, environmental protection. And it comes as Italy still sees Chinese investment as a means to spread its own economic uh, growth as well. We have seen the Itali Italian government trying to court Chinese automakers to make investments into Italy to open up new plants there. And meanwhile, Ch Ital Italy's exports to China also still depends on the sustainability and the stability of U.S.-China relations. And uh, those EU tariffs as well in focus, we see a bit of back and forth between the two sides. Premier Li Qiang, for instance, saying that uh, it vows to China vows to open up its market further to foreign companies, but at the same time, he hopes to also have a reciprocal kind of non-discriminatory environment for Chinese companies to do business in Italy. We know Italy had supported those EU tariffs on Chinese EVs. China trying to wrangle more negotiation room here ahead of the November deadline when those tariffs will finally be decided. Uh, Maloney is going to meet with President Xi today where she's expected to raise the issue of Ukraine as well. Sources tell us that she views presidency as an important player here to stabilize relations, especially in the event of a Trump presidency that could see Washington cut off its support for Ukraine. Um, and, and meanwhile, uh, China's vice finance ministers push back against U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's latest criticism of China's industrial excess. What's going on? Yeah, this had taken place during the G20 summit in Rio de Janeiro, uh, where we heard again Janet Yellen raising uh, the overcapacity issues again, saying that more emerging countries are voicing similar concerns. And the vice finance minister of China hit back with multiple arguments, saying that number one, China is a force for good for the world, that these uh, goods that are value for money is a force for disinflation. He also says it contributes to climate change as well, to other countries' goal of of achieving carbon neutrality by 2030. He said currently the projection for demand for new energy vehicles in 2030 still exceeds the current supply. And meanwhile, he said China's strength in manufacturing doesn't come primarily from state subsidies. He said there are other factors such as corporate investment into R&D, innovation, entrepreneurship. He said the reason why some other countries had missed out on these EV opportunities was because they had enjoyed advantages in the traditional auto manufacturing sector that led them not to seek out new growth opportunities. But the opposite had happened for China. They sought out these opportunities because they didn't have those advantages in traditional manufacturing. And he pointed to how other countries had also seen huge inflows of investments into areas like IT, into shale gas, into biopharma in the past that led to temporary overcapacity in other developed countries as well. And so he said it's natural for there to be market disequilibrium because companies are making their own investment based on projected demand and supply. Bloomberg's China correspondent Min Min Lo there. Well, the U.S. has pledged to bring the full force of its military to defend Japan and South Korea. And that's as defense ministers from the three countries signed a deal formalizing plans for regular military training and defense talks. Uh, East Asia government editor John Herskovitz joins us now with more. So, John, how might a conflict potentially start and what could happen after that? Well, the concentration of troops on both sides of the border means a small incident could really escalate quickly. We could see something like um, an artillery strike that uh, is with retaliatory strikes, which keeps growing. And the thing is that the two Koreas have close to a million people, troops stationed near the border and enormous amounts of armaments. So if North Korea decided to go with a full-scale attack, just with conventional weapons, it could send tens of thousands of shells a minute, uh, tens of thousands of shells into the Seoul region quite quickly. And this is home to about half of South Korea's economy, the uh, I'm sorry, half of the population and the bulk of the economy. This would uh, warrant a retaliation from the U.S. and South Korea, thus making this a war quite quickly. So something small could turn into something big, just given the amount of armament and firepower on both sides of the border.
What are the main risks being seen both to civilians and the economy? And uh, I guess under what circumstances could we see this kind of risk actually arise? Yeah, if there were this type of attack, um, we could see uh, chip supplies just be devastated because South Korea is such a large manufacturer. And we have the worries about the population centers. Uh, the Seoul area is about 26 million people. If North Korea wanted to go and launch full-scale attacks, it would probably be looking at all of South Korea's cities and cities in Japan as well. And the the toll, the debt toll could just be devastating. The blows to the economy could be overwhelming. And this is the risk that North Korea presents. And it keeps trying to build to its arsenal of nuclear weapons and conventional weapons. So the risk keeps growing each day, each year, each month, the longer Kim Jong-un is in power. So are there circumstances under which it's foreseen that Kim Jong-un might use nuclear weapons? Yeah, I think that the, the people see Kim Jong-un as a rational actor, and he knows that if he were to use nuclear weapons, he would get an overwhelming attack from the uh, U.S.-led forces with South Korea. That would mean the end of his regime. That uh, could mean it would mean the end of his family rule, and his life would be at stake. Um, if Kim were to think that his regime, his life, were at risk, that there was no other alternative, this could feed into the way he thinks about the use of nuclear weapons. Um, so it's, uh, he's rational enough not to be suicidal, one analyst said in the story. And I think that this is the way that Kim frames it. He knows that this would be regime ending, possibly life ending, and that would be what he would go into it. And the U.S., South Korea, and the allies are hoping that Kim is a rational player and realizes the, enormal, the enormous risk to him if he were to ever consider using nuclear weapons. Our East Asia government editor John Herskovitz there. And uh, I wanted to get you to look at our M Live polls question gold coming out as the best Trump trade, followed by the dollar. And Paul, take a look at the sort of uh, three most popular asset classes that have been named, right? Gold at 53%, the dollar at 26%, the Swiss franc at 21%. So some of those haven, uh, obviously, sort of a couple of those haven uh, assets there. But it's interesting. The, Dollar, this bet that the dollar is going to weaken under a President Trump has been a pretty contentious view, right? We've heard from a lot of economists so they see a second Trump term as strengthening rather than weakening the currency, that bias towards harsher tariffs on US trading partners, the deficit boosting fiscal policies, potentially pro inflationary as well, uh, could inter interrupt the, 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 the rate cut scenario, but it's also kind of the question as to whether anything at this point can interrupt the, the US exceptionalism story for the dollar. Well, in terms of the performance uh, under gold, uh, under Trump, uh, there's some precedent here as well. Gold had a very big run up uh, during the last Trump presidency, although we do need to keep in mind the circumstances here it was the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. The federal funds rate fell to near zero. And if you look at across the other presidencies that you see on the board there, uh, gold is pretty politically agnostic, really. A uh, big run up there under Jimmy Carter. Of course, he was dealing with an energy crisis, and uh, George W. Bush dealing with 9 11. So, um, yeah, there are other circumstances beyond the, the personality of the person in the White House that, uh, that drives gold. Yeah, and I mean, gold is a little bit more straightforward. You can see the argument for the Swiss franc, and I wonder if you can see the argument for the yen as well. Of course, that depends on what happens with the US dollar. But, you know, one analyst saying if it's the US creating its own risk premium, then is the US dollar still? behave an asset to fall back into, right? It's a bit of a existential head scratcher. Yeah, yeah, it's a paradox, a conundrum. <laughs> um, yeah, gold, gold just does its thing though, right? All right, more to come on the Asia trade. This is Bloomberg. Pacific Airlines carried almost 29 million international passengers in June, and that's a 21% increase from the same time last year. The latest figures are from the Association of Asia Pacific Airlines, and they also show an increased demand in air cargo. 
So let's discuss the outlook for the region, bring in Subhas Menon, the Director General at the AAPA right here in Sydney. Subhas, thanks for joining us today. Um, when you look at those statistics that you've just released a few minutes ago, uh, can we say now that that's it, business as usual, we're back to where we were before the pandemic? Yes, I would say it's business as usual, although quantitatively there's still uh, some ways to go, 90% of uh, 2019 levels. Uh, but qualitatively, um, I think you know uh, the flights are doing well. Load factors are very high; they're higher than they have ever been. Um, cargo has also recovered. Um, so yeah, so I think uh, it's business as usual. You know, air transport is uh, uh, you know a, a social and economic necessity in Asia Pacific, which is not a contiguous region. You know, so I think the most important measure is connectivity measured in terms of unique uh, city pairs. Uh, this has already recovered uh, to beyond 2019 uh, uh, levels uh, at the end of last year. One area perhaps where we're not back to normal is of course ticket prices, airfares. Uh, is that a function of inflation? Is this the new normal or can you see perhaps those prices coming down and what would it mean for profitability? Prices will eventually come down. You know, uh, It's a matter of demand and supply. You know, in uh, places where supply has already uh, matched demand or even exceeding demand, you know, for instance, the U.S., U.K., Europe, you know, even I, I suppose Australia, here, yeah, and uh, Japan, um, you know, you find that uh, you know airfares are already moderating. But for pretty much most of uh, the Asia Pacific region, supply is an issue, you know, because of the supply chain uh, problems uh, that the world is facing, and uh, unfortunately, the recovery of the Asia-Pacific region started just about when the supply chain woes uh, started to hit, hit uh, the economies. The, the trend isn't uniform, though, when it comes to price cuts, right? And yeah. we have seen some more price cuts from Qantas, although arguably travellers aren't really feeling it just yet. Yes, where yeah. do you see kind of the, the, the bigger surge in demand and where do you perhaps see a little bit more slackness in the market? I think the, uh, as far as demand is concerned, I think in the Asia-Pacific region, of course, uh, China has not come to the lunch table yet. You know? So, uh, but um, you know, pretty much most of the other economies, India, for instance, ASEAN, you know, they are really enjoying the buffet. You know, for China, I think the problem is really outbound travel, because the Chinese economy is not doing very well. You know, but uh, inbound, China is seeing a, a big, uh, big increase, and fares have actually come down uh, for for flights into China. Japan is, uh, you know, on the similar path, and you could see outbound travel is a problem because of currency inflation. But inbound, Japan is, is has already exceeded 2019 levels. It's interesting. The Bloomberg World Airlines Index uh, showing that fares are down about 15 percent over the last 12 months, which is an interesting statistic. Um, mm. Particularly the reaction that you get from, you know, airline bosses, right? Emirates President Tim Clark does not like it. He says that the airlines need to hold their nerve. Are we seeing the risk of capitulation? If, if one airline cuts prices, are we going to see others follow? Well, it's a very dynamic situation. And I would say that, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, foolhardy to imagine that, you know, you can hold up prices. You know, when the, when the supply is meeting uh, demand, you know, airfares are, are bound to come down, you know. And uh, that's good for everything, you know, because a rising tide uh, raises all boats, you know. So I think, uh, you know, as competition increases, you know, and as markets uh, uh, start to, to show, uh, you know, the same tendencies uh, that we uh, saw uh, pre-COVID, uh, fares will moderate and get back to where they were. How about business travel? Is that back to where it was as well? Because in the days of the pandemic, it was, oh, we can do all of this on Zoom now. There's no need to get together face to face. Mm -hmm. Or has that idea uh, gone out of fashion? Well, you know, in, uh, when, when, when COVID hit, you know, everybody wrote the death knell of business travel. But actually, it's the opposite. You know, business travel is doing even better than leisure travel, you know. And I would say that business, the business travel uh, uh, market can be divided into two. Those who book early, you know, and are traveling regularly, and the others, you know, who uh, wish they could but cannot find the seats. You know, so uh, fares uh, for business travel are at a premium. And uh, also, I think the airlines have also taken the opportunity to 
to uh, move into secondary destinations, especially in the Asia Pacific region, using smaller aircraft types. You know, the Embraer has come to the Asia Pacific region and flying in the region, and also the turboprop operations have expanded. For instance, in India, Indigo is flying uh, many flights with turboprop to uh, remote areas of India and bringing tourists, you know, as well as providing air transport, you know, which is very much needed for the industry. How's the recovery for cargo? And, and I guess in particular when it comes to trade, are there now concerns about risks that might be coalescing around what happens after November and if there are more trade tensions globally? Absolutely. I think trade tensions, you know, affected um, cargo very badly uh, last year. Uh, but since the turn of the year, we have seen air cargo also bounce back, you know. Uh, and I think this is mainly because uh, of, uh, of e-commerce, you know, it's doing very well. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, uh, I think uh, consumer sentiment has also improved in the Asia Pacific region. Air cargo for the first uh, six months of this year has grown 16% over the previous year. You know, uh, at the same time, you know, I think uh, there is a shift uh, from uh, maritime transport of cargo to air cargo you know, because of the uh, uh, tensions that we are seeing in the in the world. You know, and also airspace closures and and um, you know sea lane closures has also uh, increased the yields you know for air cargo mm -hmm. so air cargo market is uh, doing very well so that's always great to have you with us first Madden, who's a director general at the aapa more ahead on the asia trade this is bloomberg Get a quick roundup of the key earnings to watch this week. More results from uh, the Meg 7 stocks will arrive. The Nasdaq 100 in the meantime on the brink of a correction. Microsoft's report will come on the heels of the global IT crash, of course. Bloomberg Intelligence, meanwhile, expecting Meta's ad pricing to drive a beat in sales growth. And other than big tech, we've got major lenders, including HSBC, Standard Chartered, also reporting earnings against the backdrop of slow loan growth. And, uh, of course, that's in addition to the Japanese bank earnings as well. Yo, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, bring in Rachel Yeo, who covers breaking earnings news for Bloomberg. And uh, Rachel, let's start with HSBC and Standard Chartered. Uh, what are we looking out for here? Yes, yeah, so we are expecting HSBC and Standard Chartered to report this week on the backdrop of uh, lower loan growth. So both banks are expected to announce uh, fresh buybacks uh, during in their upcoming earnings. And uh, they might see some pressure in their net interest margins from uh, falling high borrow rates in Hong Kong over the quarter as well. And for HSBC earlier, there's definitely been some chatter, especially after the bank announced uh, George Ahadari as a uh, new CEO taking over Noel Quinn. So he will be having this challenge of uh, trying to increase revenue as rates fall. And under his leadership, we might be able to see some cost management uh, sh uh, efforts and uh, new strategies uh, being unveiled within this year. And for Standard Chartered, uh, the lender is expected to meet the higher end of their guidance for their net interest income for 2024. Samsung also reporting final quarterly earnings. Of course, we have the prelim numbers to go by as well. What are the expectations? Yeah, so earlier in their prelims, uh, definitely they are seeing their strongest sales uh, in years for that quarter. Uh, this is because of uh, strong demand in AI. Uh, picking up uh, sales for memory chips. So earlier on, Samsung also reviewed a line of like Galaxy smartphones earlier this month. So that might see more uh, stable earnings, especially in the mobile division in the future. All right, breaking news earnings specialist uh, Rachel Yeo there. All right, uh, before we leave you, uh, we've got to talk about the games, of course. <laughs> Heidi, underway now. Um, Australia doing very well on the medal table. Uh, Jess Fox, the latest gold for Australia, winning, winning the women's kayak singles final. And this is the thing that always amuses me about the, the Olympics. For 24 hours, we're all suddenly kayak fans. Uh, I'm, you know, massive equestrian fan here, um, dedicated to watching the gymnastics as well. But I do love, you know, it is the breadth of, you know, some of the perhaps, you know, weird and wonderful sports that you don't watch for 
uh, all the other months of all the other years as well, right? But um, it, this, you know, extraordinary stories at the moment. This is the the tally. You've got four gold, four gold for Japan and for Australia as well. Three for the USA, France, and Korea. Uh, friendly rivalry, but also, of course, you know, quite a bit of sort of. Uh, good natured ribbing between countries as well, right? Yeah, definitely. And, and e even if you don't have a, a, a dog in the race, uh, there are always moments that you can savour. And a, a great example would be that football match today uh, between the Australian women's football team and Zambia. Uh, if you're not from either of one of those countries, you probably wouldn't care. But 6 5, an unbelievable score, <laughs> and Australia coming back from 5 2 down. Uh, the, these are the sorts of really wild matches that provide insane highlights that are always entertaining to watch uh, no matter where you're from but you know do you watch them uh, how much have you caught of this the time zone is horrible for us yeah it's uh, it's not it's not great I was very happy that uh, we were able to in the evening on Saturday to watch um, some of the gymnastics teams uh, uh, events as well particularly to catch of course you know the, the the woman that everyone's focused on which is Simone Biles and her spectacular uh, events that we saw last night but also just some of the the kind of you know less traditional sports as well Skateboarding is another yeah. great one. Mm. Um, so, yes, lots of tired people as we uh, get into the next couple of weeks, of sh uh, I'm sure, and uh, lots of sort of uh, armchair commentary as well as you mm. sit there kind of eating your pizza and uh, uh, talking about whether a gymnastics con contestant yeah. has, has, has stuck their landing or not. We're all experts now. Yeah, of course. Yeah. We could do that easily. Sure. <laughs> Uh, and of course, other than the Olympics, if you're also focusing on the markets, it is a big week for central banks, the Fed, the BOJ, the BOE as well, if you're watching on that side of the world. Uh, all of this playing into how we kind of see this next leg up to the summer trade. The US futures looking like we'll extend the rally we saw on Friday. And of course, a lot of conviction that the Fed, you know, if not this week, then perhaps in September, and all of that's going to drive earnings as well. Uh, Taiwan futures up by 1.7%. The big question, Paul, is whether we kind of start to see that reversal of uh, the big sell-off that we saw in tech. All right, that is it from the Asia Trade. Markets coverage uh, continues as we look ahead to the start of trade in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Shenzhen. So stay with us. China Show up next. This is Bloomberg.